Well, good morning, saints of God. In the beautiful Colorado morning, this is one of my main reasons I love to be in Colorado. So the fall is so beautiful. A special welcome to any of our first-time guests. We are grateful to have you here with us, and we get to worship our God together. I caught a little cold, and just um, I'm on a lot of cold medicine, so if I make no sense more than normal, I want you just to pray for me, okay? <laughs> So today, we're going to be taken back up in Romans chapter 4, if you'll turn there with me. My heart has just been overwhelmed with this section and just uh, praying for blessing upon your souls. I have been so encouraged in this section of Scripture. So by way of reminder, as we close out chapter 4 then this morning, as Paul wrote this book, and he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And so this gospel can rescue us from the wrath of God and from our sin that we are under its dominion, whether Jew or Gentile, whether moral, immoral, religious or irreligious, we are under the dominion of sin And there's a gospel that is available to us and what Paul is laboring to show you by faith alone apart from the works of the law. So what a glorious gospel. There's not a better message that could ever be and where to give our lives to proclaim it and to love it and to believe it. So faith is not mentioned again after that in Romans 1, 16 through 17 for two chapters. And Paul is showing us then the necessity of our need. He's showing us the depth of our sinfulness and the thoroughness of our need for a gospel. We need a but now in Romans 3.21. The only hope for humanity is this but now of what God has done to remedy our condition, a condition that He's shown thoroughly that we cannot remedy in and of ourself. There's no hope in humanity. The only hope is but now what God has done in Christ Jesus. And then in Romans 3.22, he comes back to faith again. Even the righteousness of God, this God kind of righteousness that's given in the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. And so there's a righteousness available to us from God, and it comes by faith. And chapter 3 has been showing us faith in what? Well, faith in a Christ who came and paid a ransom price. He paid the ransom to redeem us and bring us back to God. And He did it by propitiating the wrath of God on a cross, draining every last drop that we deserved as He hung on that cross. And righteousness then, God's righteousness is put to your account. And now God looks at you as if you are perfectly righteous in Him. And so as we've journeyed, faith contains two aspects. Faith looks at self and it despairs. It finds no hope. Chapters 1 through 3, when, when you look at yourself, faith says there's nothing in me, there's no righteousness, there's no hope in me. And so the other part of faith then is it looks to Christ. It looks at Christ and it believes and trusts and rejoices in Romans 3 through 4 what God has done for us in His Son. Martin Luther said, when I look at myself, I think, how can I be saved But when I look at Christ, I think, how could I ever be lost? Faith or believing is then used 19 times after verse 22 of chapter 3. Faith brings the forgiveness of God for our sin. Faith brings us into the favor of God. And last week, faith brings the future blessing of the new heavens and the new earth with the promise of God. Faith in Jesus Christ is the connector to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And his conclusion in verse 16 last week is the only thing that works with grace that God wants to do all of this and be put on display for all of His glory and who He is and He wants to be the giver. And so the only thing that will ever work with that cannot be works, not even 1%. It has to be faith alone that looks to what God has done alone and believes in that alone. And he said, therefore, you can be certain. You can be absolutely certain of your salvation because it's all of grace and not you. Thank you, 
Jesus. And so faith is everything. It's the key to the promise of God, and it's so important. And what I've seen in my journey is if the devil can't get you off on works and trying to attain and achieve and merit God's favor, then he will try to discredit your faith and leave you despairing all of your days. Is, do I have enough faith? Is it big enough? And, and he'll just leave you rocked and wrecked by attacking your faith. So this morning... Paul's going to go deep into what is the nature and character then of true faith. If, if faith is our only hope, he's going to look now and say, what is faith? What is true faith? What does it look like? And we're going to dig in a little bit this morning to the characteristics of faith. And we're going to look at the faith that saved Abraham, and it's the same faith that will save us. And I want to take it up this morning then and ask God to show us the beauty of this faith so we can be certain that we possess it. And so may God meet us here this morning in a way that strengthens faith and maybe even creates it in some hearts this morning that need a true saving faith. And so I pray that you would see what has come in Christ Jesus in all the fullness of this gospel. So let's go to our God who can do, he's the only one who could do what I just asked. Father God, we come before you in this beautiful morning in your presence God, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for the glory of what we've been staring at. And I pray now, Lord, as we look at faith, Lord, it is, it is a gift from you. No one can create it. No one can muster it up. It's a gift from Almighty God. And so we thank you. We treasure it more than our necessary food. God, I thank you for the gift of gifts, the faith in Christ Jesus. And so I pray now, I thank you that you hold it and you purify it, and you strengthen it. And I would ask that you would do that even this morning through the Word of God. God, I pray that you would come and bless us now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> and I pray that our stunt flyer will just come by once and not do this, bring us back to memories of Ray's sermon. <clears throat> Let me give you your outline this morning <clears throat> to help us journey this section well. Paul's going to show us two aspects of Abraham's faith for our blessing. And in verses 17 through 22, we're going to look at saving, saving faith. It's going to be practically described. And then in verses 23 through 25, saving faith will be personally applied. There's a reason we're studying this. Paul's going after something, and we will close with that this morning. So let's together look first at saving faith practically Described. And what we're going to see in these verses is six characteristics of Abraham's faith, and they're just beautiful. So let's look at the first one. <clears throat> faith is God-centered. Faith believes in God, and it believes what He says. And this is so important because faith is exalted and it's loved in our world. Uh, it, it, we just celebrate faith. We need faith. Faith is, but it, it's only as good as its object. It's only as good as to where it attaches itself. It, it's not just faith that saves. It is faith in God of a promise through a seed that would bring blessing to all the nations. And so I want you to hear this. Saving faith finds its attachment to the God of Abraham. God is the very center of biblical faith. In Romans 4.3, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. This morning in Romans 4.17, it says, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God. And in Romans 4.24, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And so we've seen that we have faith in the Redeemer, but we have faith in the God of the Redeemer. Who, whose wrath did he come to propitiate? He came to propitiate the Father's wrath. What righteousness is given to us? He says the righteousness of God. The glory that we all fall, fall short of is the glory of God. We believe in the Son of God. God displayed Him as a propitiation so that He could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. And so in the face of Christ, we see the glory of God and Jesus is the radiance of his glory and the mediator between us and God. So faith leads us to God the Father. He's the one who gave us this gospel. 
He saves us unto himself. All this nonsense that Jesus came to try to turn the Father's heart to want to save us is foolishness. God is the one who gave us this gospel. And so we look to Christ with an eye of faith who was sent by God to be the Savior of the world. We look to this God. And so what did, what did he believe about God? And the two things were told here in verse 17. We, he believed that he gives life to the dead, and he calls into being that which does not exist. He gives life to the dead. He believes in a resurrecting God. And our context was the deadness of Abraham and Sarah's womb when God gives a promise of a seed that will come from you. And so God can make dead things alive. And you see with God that that deadness is not a dead end, as we'll see in this passage as it progresses this morning. Abraham learned this well. When he had the son of promise, he finally had Isaac, and God says, Abraham, go offer up your son now, Isaac, on the altar as a sacrifice. And And they go, and he says to his servant, we will be right back. And in Hebrews 11, he interprets it for us. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. And it was to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. There's the promise. And he considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. He believed that God gives life to the dead, and if I drive this knife through my son's chest, God will bring him back from the dead. And so Abraham believed that. And he believed that God calls into being that which does not exist. And this is not so much talking about creation. Thomas Schreiner said, God summons or calls what does not exist as if it does. And so in in this expression is that God created from an impotent and barren wife a multitude of nations. And God changes this man from Abram, his name, which meant father of many, who I'm sure he was teased his whole life with no children. And I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude of nations. As if he he already was. The deadness of Sarah's womb and all the barrenness. And God is now speaking. It's going to come forth. Nations are going to come from you. And God can talk about it like it's an already done deal because he's purposed it and he has decreed it. He He can call into being that which does not exist. And we're going to journey into Romans 8, but I'm going to jump forward just for a moment. In Romans 8, God says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And all these are going to be aorist verbs, these little snapshots of past tense action. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And they're all in the past tense, even our glorification. And so God can speak about things as if they are, because he will bring them to pass. He's purposed it. Your glorification will come to pass because God spoke it. It will happen. And this is beautiful that God can look at Abraham and Sarah, and they're dead as to childbearing. And say, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. It's the foundation of the whole Bible, the promise of how God would bless the nations. And because of his omnipotence and his decree, he can speak about it as if it's already happened. And so whatever God says or promises, faith can bank on it. Faith can give our lives to it. It can trust it. It's a sure foundation. I see my brother, you're going to see your wife again. (laughs) God said it. You'll be glorified and we'll be in glory together. There's just nothing that he cannot do. And so what I think Paul wants us to get from this is grace overrides our demerit. All of our sin we've learned and studied. And he covers us in merit. He covers us in the righteousness of Christ. We stand perfect and blameless before Him this morning. This is grace, and God promises it. 
He will guarantee a future inheritance that we looked at last week. Hell itself cannot stop the inheritance that God has already spoken that is yours. It's certain. It's done. He's established it. He's decreed it. He can talk past tense. You're glorified in the mind of God because it's based on grace and His doing. So you can be certain. I think of that type he said in Hebrews 11 that I just read. I believe that with Isaac... God made it to show that no human can beget children of promise. They're dead. It's an impossibility. And I think it's this type that by law, you're never going to become a child of promise. You can't go out and be religious and clean yourself up and be a good person to become a child of promise. You can't do it through your own doing. God only gets children by grace. For the promise to be fulfilled... God made it where Abraham couldn't do it. (laughs) He could not get children on his own. And when he tried, he just got Ishmael. So with our promise, Paul has labored to show you it's by faith. And you can't do anything to make yourself a child of promise. But fall on Christ who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, faith and makes you sons and daughters of God. The birth can only come from a supernatural God. Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And God can birth children into this promise and give them the gift of faith. I want you to listen to something amazing. Galatians 4. Paul's going to describe this whole type. Tell me, You who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael, Isaac, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman was born through the promise of God that we've been studying. And this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are slaves. She's Hagar. And now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she's in slavery with her children trying to get right with God by law. But the Jerusalem above is free. She's our mother. For it's it's written, rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. You've been born by grace and you've been born from above. In Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. So I want you to hear this, please. As I look at myself, I say no way God can save me and bring me into this inheritance. There's just too many things so contradictory about my heart and my life and who I am. A man named Samuel Davies, Lloyd-Jones, said he was the best American preacher. And he wrote this in a letter to a friend. He said, I'm so grieved that I have made so little progress in the faith. I'm so grieved that I've made so little progress in the faith. And so grace looks at me already glorified. He gave me life from the dead. And he calls into being that which does not exist glorification. And so this passage is screaming at us to trust the God of promise and to trust the promise of God and faith is God-centered. If God names it, you can claim it. And so I want us to begin with this first point, faith is God-centered and it looks to Him who gives life to the dead. 
and calls into being that which does not exist. Second point, faith anchors its hope in the divine promise. I want you to look with me in verse 17. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you the promise. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. And hope against hope, Abraham believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. So in hope against hope. And here is Abraham's battle. And I believe this is truly our battle as we sit here this morning. There, there are two hopes here in conflict. And one is what we're going to call human hope. And that is what fills our land on a daily basis and too often our own hearts. It, it's for hope for a better life a better situation, a better circumstance, a better country. And then we look at our human resources and our abilities and our presidential candidates and all these different things that we, we look at to bring it about. And we hope that our, by our doing or other people's doing that we can fulfill these things that we desire and are hoping for. It's a natural hope. It's optimism but things are going to get better. And Abraham had some of that hope. There was some human hope to Abraham. And the promise was that out of his seed would come a multitude of nations. And this hope is beginning to evaporate with age. It's been a long time since God promised it. Now he's 100. Sarah's 90. But in the face of that dwindling hope, there's another hope. And this hope is anchored in God and His promises. In hope, biblical hope, he believed God. He believed a more sure word. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It's not irrational and it's not emotional. He latched on to the promise of God and His word and it was in hope. And so faith sees the promise of God and what he says, and it sees it as hope. That God gives life to the dead, and he calls into being that which does not exist. He hopes in God and what he promises and what he says he'll do. And so our faith is anchored in what? Not the, the worldly hope, but it's anchored in the promises of God. So what happens when the worldly hope starts going away? We're a light, we're a city set on a hill because our hope was never America and it was never in all the things that we hoped for in America. Our hope is in this, the city whose builder and maker is God. And so our hope is in God and the God who has promised the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells forever. And so we have a hope despite what I see out there and even despite what I see in myself, as I sit here this morning, what I got to look at still in my own heart, this is the whole Christian life. Against hope, we believe. Against the circumstances and what we see and what's going on with a, a world running crazy and seems like the, the sin is winning. And we, we hope against all that false hope that's going on in our midst, and we hope against all the false hope that I'll ever be able to be righteous enough to get God's approval or favor. I gotta look to what God says and what he promises. This is the whole Christian life. Against hope, we believe the promise of God, especially in this day and age that we live in. You're gonna, you're gonna be set apart to have a people who have a hope in God that can't change and won't be taken away and as every, all the other hopes go away, we just keep trusting in peace and joy and happiness. They're going to start asking you, what is the hope within you? This is our time to shine. John Wesley said, in hope against hope, all human hope, self-desperate I believe, faith, mighty faith, sees the promise alone. It laughs at impossibilities and it cries it shall be done. It believes the promise of God. And so the first aspect of faith, it's God-centered. 
Secondly, it anchors its hope then in His divine promises. And the third aspect of faith is it obtained the promise. I want you to see that in verse 18. <clears throat> in hope against hope, He believed so that He might become a father of many nations. According to that which has been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And so Abraham, the barren one, would be a father of many nations. And this morning, the faith of Abraham spans the entire globe. This Christ, this seed that came into the world, is being worshipped all over the world. He obtained the promise. And every day that someone comes with the faith of Abraham, that promise just keeps spreading to more seed and what God said He would do. God is being worshipped as the giver of Christ to fulfill the promise to Abraham and to us. And so this is so good. Faith sees the promise in the Word of God and it clings to it and God gives its fulfillment. He's promised the one who believes in Christ without being a working one, is justified and he will be glorified by the grace of God. By faith, you will receive the promise of God. Hell itself cannot separate you from it. We'll see that in Romans 8. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's promise is certain and he will bring it to pass. Nothing can thwart it. Nothing can stop it or break it. My life is just a history of this promise. He who began a good work, he'll be faithful to complete it. And our whole life is he just keeps working and training and growing and holding us. And the fact that you sit here still loving Christ is because of the promise of our God and the grace of God. One of my heroes, Octavius Winslow, my wife didn't want to name one of our kids that. I don't know why. Octavius is beautiful. He said the promises of God are the jewelry of the Bible. Every page of this volume is rich and sparkly with these divine assurances of Jehovah's love, power, and faithfulness toward His people. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. God will keep all His promises because we are in Christ. Every promise will come to us that He has made in Christ Jesus. So first, faith is God-centered. It anchors its hope on the divine promises and it obtains the promise. And now fourthly, I want you to see that Abraham's faith looked at its challenges in the faith, in the face. So, so faith doesn't just say, woo, I can't hear you and ignore everything around you. And so this is big in verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Saving faith faces the hard facts. It does not ignore them and just use little platitudes and phony little sayings to get through life. It looks at the realness of the things you're facing and dealing with. And so Abraham looked and he contemplated his own body. And that word contemplate means to give in-depth consideration. To look at something in a very reflective manner. And so Abraham considered all the obstacles to this promise that God was given. I'm going to make you a father of nations. Looking at himself a hundred years old. Looking it right in the face. Not ignoring it. Have you contemplated yours? Maybe this morning yours isn't your body being a hundred for you to receive the promise of God, you're sitting here going, my sin is too great. If you knew what I did in 1987, you would never talk to me. There's no way God could forgive me. My perseverance just isn't good. There's just better people than I am. I'm, I'm bad raw material. No one has ever wanted me in this journey. Why would God? I fail at everything. Can't get any better. There's no way God can save me. You're looking at your, your circumstances, yourself, who you are, and what's outside of you. And Abraham did. He looked at the situation. He looked at his own body, now as good as dead. He looked at his ability to produce seed for promise. And he sees the obstacle. And he looks at his wife, 
and the deadness of her womb, and there's just no hope in any of these things. And he, he looks them in the face. But listen to this. As he looked at these things, which many of us, they would have just disheartened us and discouraged us, and we would have quit. But Abraham looked at them all, and he didn't become weak in faith. And he did not waver in unbelief. And that's what I need this morning. That's what I need for all of us this morning. So when we look at these things all around us and within us, that we don't grow weak in faith and we don't waver in unbelief. And so why? Why did he not waver? Because there was one more thing in the equation as he looked at his own body and Sarah's. And the other thing in the equation was Yahweh. Was God. When he comes into the equation, I want you to hear this. The obstacles to his promises no longer matter. God is bigger than the problems and the obstacles. Whatever they are this morning, faith brings God into the equation and not just the obstacles. That is what unbelief does. Unbelief looks at the obstacles and faith brings God into the obstacles. And so are you just looking at your obstacles this morning? Are you bringing God into your obstacles and the things that you're facing. I was thinking about those 12 spies this morning. And, and they go out, and 10 of them, all they look at is the circumstances. We're like grasshoppers among these big people. There's no way we can have the promise of God. And the other two bring God into the equation and say, surely God calls into being that which does not exist. And he said, I will give you this promised land. It will happen. And so when you bring God into your life, and your circumstances, bring him in. And that is what faith does. And so this is amazing. Abraham did not let what he saw of all of its impossibility take away his faith in God's promise. And so whatever obstacles you're fighting this morning about the promise, I just want you to look at the God who promises salvation by faith in Christ alone. Look your eyes out. That's what faith is. Look at the fire and the flood that are going on in your life. Look at death. Look at your personal sin. And I want you not to waver as you look at the God of promise. Because of the promises of God, my life is determined by God who is uh, and who promises. By faith, I live under the promises of God that we are righteous and justified and loved and accepted and we will be glorified. By faith, I look to God and I, I don't let my circumstances and the things that I see to, to take that away. Faith looks past it. it. It looks at it and deals with it, but it, it looks to the God of promise and it believes what He says. Oh, what He has laid up for the people of God. And he did it without becoming weak in faith. And I just, I'm going to keep moving in our outline, but I want to make one quick application because I, I have no self control. Abraham's faith wasn't perfect. He had the ups and downs in the life of faith like all of us. We saw it with Sarah when he said, She's my sister. We saw it with Ish. Male. But this is not every event in his life. When you look at the whole big picture, there's time when our faith is strong, there's time when it's weak. But Abraham's life was characterized by a growing, persevering faith. So ups and downs. But here's the big picture. It's not looking at the dark night of the soul, but it's looking at this growing faith of Abraham. And so my joy as a pastor is to, to watch this growing, deepening, persevering faith happen. We had the, the young disciples over on Monday. And I hadn't seen them. I, I used to get to be with them every week. And the growth was unbelievable to me to see what God is doing in their hearts and the way He's deepening and, and sweetening their hope. I got a sister here that I had dinner with her and her husband and Laura and it just since I've known her, it's been one diagnosis after another. 
And when I first met her, those diagnoses would bring anxiety. And now every new lump and every new test, I just keep seeing the sweet faith that hopes and trusts in God and looks to Him as our all in all. And so all of us have this growing faith and, and we're growing to trust in the promises of God. And that's the, the picture with, with Abraham. And so I want you to see it's not perfect faith. It's not that it doesn't have ups and downs, but it, it's a faith that what I'm watching is you, you, you have your fears and your tears and your hard days, but you won't let go of this promise that God has given us in Christ Jesus. And then one more thought. If Abraham didn't grow weak in faith or waver, what was possible then? What, what's possible is that you can waver and you can grow weak in your faith. So we can vacillate between faith and unbelief. That's the fight of faith. And so what are some things that can weaken our faith? It's fear. Fear going on right now in our society is fear can start overcoming you of what could come or what is here today. And fear starts weakening faith. Sin starts weakening faith. The, one of the most common times to chuck it and walk away is in college and you begin to get into sin and endure. And so this, this sin can begin to weaken faith. Bad counsel can weaken faith. Suffering can weaken faith. So there's all these things that are fighting against us that can weaken faith. But I want you to look at our fifth point in verse 20. Abraham grew strong in faith. There's a way that, that these things that will weaken faith, there's a way to strengthen faith. There, there's a way to get it stronger. And it's going to be by the Word of God. And it's going to be by the means of grace and even fellowshipping with those who have greater faith. Some of my best blessings are getting with you guys who, who have learned how to trust God way better in different circumstances. And you grow just from learning from each other. And so there's all these ways that we grow and strengthen faith. But look in verse 20. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. So beautiful. Rather than becoming weak in faith and wavering, he, he could look at his own body and he grew strong in faith. That's what I need. That's what I want. And so guys, we, we battle with many things. We battle depression, assurance, sin, anxiety, coveting. Not making your job an idol, family, divorce, death of a loved one. There's our battles. But we keep trusting God. And we keep fighting the fight of faith and this amazing promise of where He's moving all of history. And I just keep fighting to, to grow strong in faith and not let go of it. When, when I go to gravesides, I, I, I love those who have died in faith, and I can just look at that casket and say it's going to open again and God's going to raise that body to immortality, to eternal life. Keep fighting the fight of faith and these amazing promises of God and your chronic diseases. Our dear brother Kirk and Rima, I just, I just think of how long term these things go on and they just won't let go of their hope in God. All hell comes against it. And many things by the human eye can cause you to grow weak in faith and waver, but we need to keep fighting to believe the promises of God and getting stronger in our faith. The more I watch God work, the stronger my faith is getting. He just he's, he's, he keeps his promises. He does what he says. And if I could just trust it on the front end instead of the back end, what glory and peace that would bring into my life. And you know what comes from this. The one who grows in faith. I want you just to see it in verse 20. He'll give glory to God. Because I watch all the, pe all the time people chuck God when they don't get what they want on this earth. This current season, I've seen people walk away from Christ. And when we've manipulated God's Word and made false promises and when He doesn't keep them, we walk away. But when you look all around, when all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. And when we do that, He looks so good and trustworthy and beautiful 
<coughs> excuse me, insufficient. When we trust the promises of God in the middle of all the other kind of hope and all the things that are going on in this world, you show the world a God who's beautiful, a God who's trustworthy. And so if you have a passion for the glory of God, it's to trust Him in the middle of all of life and all the things that are thrown at us and all the things that could be thrown at us. It's to trust this God and to believe His promises. I use that illustration. It's kind of old, but I'm going to use it again. As I remember at the swim pool, standing there with my son going, man, jump in. Jump in, Daddy will catch you. And he's biting his teeth and shivering and, and the whole pool's watching. And, and you're just sitting there feeling like, man, he's just showing the whole, the whole swim pool that Dad has. He's not going to catch me. He's going to let me drown. He does, he's not sufficient enough to take care of me. But when he just jumps into your arms, man, it makes Dad look good and trustworthy. And so I pray that your passion is to make your father look good and trustworthy. One that you can put your head down on your pillow in peace no matter what's going on. We have the opportunity to to glorify God by trusting His promises. He's not a liar. He's going to keep them. This isn't confusing. This isn't tricky. Four-year-olds can do this. I believe God. And I trust Him despite what I see. It doesn't weaken my faith or cause me to waver because God said it. I believe it. And I can trust Him. And when I do, He looks really good to the world. What a God they have who can hold them in times like this. I want you to hear John Calvin. He said, Our circumstances are all in opposition to the promises of God. He promises us immortality, yet we're surrounded by mortality and corruption. He declares that He counts us just, yet we're covered with sins. He testifies that He's propitious and benevolent towards us, yet outward signs threaten His wrath. What then are we to do? We must close our eyes, disregard ourselves, and all things connected with us so that nothing may hinder or prevent us from believing that God is true. Close your eyes and believe the promises of God. Let God be true, though every man be found a liar. And then he goes on, he says, when Paul adds giving glory to God, we must note that no greater honor can be given to God than by sealing His truth by our faith. No greater insult can be shown to Him than by rejecting the grace which He offers to us. The main thing in the worship of God is to embrace His promises with the obedience of faith. The best way to make God look good is to believe His truth. And the way to make Him look bad is to disbelieve it. And so there's how we put God on display. So let's look at our sixth point. Faith's God-centered. It anchors its hope in divine promises. If faith obtains the promise, faith, Abraham's faith looked its challenges in the faith, the face, and then he grew strong in faith. And Abraham's faith, this last point, was fully convinced in God's character in verse 21. I want you to hear this so beautiful. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he is able to perform. And if I could summarize the Bible in a nutshell, he is able. He's able to do abundantly beyond what you could hope, think, or dream. And so here's the whole thing. If, if God says it, He's able. And my, my faith is just confident that God is able to do everything that He says. And I want to live into that. I want to live into a God who's able. He is able to do what He promises and what He says. And we get to believe that and live into it. So faith believes that God is able. Amen? And now let's... He concludes the the bookend of the section in verse 22. Therefore, because he believed, it was credited to him as righteousness. Not by the works of the law, not by circumcision. He just believed God and it was put to his account as righteous and he stood accepted and loved before God. Abraham believed God And it was credited to him as righteousness. Amen? That's our hope. So there's our first point. Saving faith 
practically described. Now, the second point, I've preached it in detail. I've spent hours and hours upon it, and I'm just going to spend a couple minutes this morning. Saving faith personally applied. And what I want you to see now is Abraham had to believe that God would bring seed. And in that seed, singular, one day he would bring one who would bring about salvation. And in that seed, all the nations would be blessed. All who believe in that seed would be saved. And so Abraham had to believe God that he would give life to this dead womb. And now we stand on this side and we have to look back because that seed has now come into the world. That seed was born of a virgin. And he came in and that seed, we have found out, is fully God and fully man. Emmanuel came into the world. And that seed came and he fulfilled the law and he loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength every second of every day. And that seed was put up on a cross. It was a bloodied seed in our place. It bore the wrath of God. And that seed was put in the ground and God gave life to the dead. And he raised that seed. And that seed is now seated in heaven in victory. And all who will believe upon that name will be made right with God. They will be justified. So we believe in the same seed. Abraham believed in that seed. And now for us this morning, our faith is in a colored out, beautiful seed called Jesus Christ. And I want you to see now in verse 23. Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him. It wasn't just for Abraham. He didn't just record that so Abraham would know that. But in verse 24, but for our sake also. And our sake also is every soul sitting here this morning. For our sake also, to whom it will be logizomide, it will be credited to our account as those who believe in Him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions. This is what's called a, a divine act of um, God is the one who delivered him over. God the Father. And so, who, who killed Jesus? God the Father. God the Father delivered him over because of our sin. And he was put up on a cross. And the full wrath of God for all of my transgressions was poured out on the Son of God until he breathed his last on a cross. And then he was buried and he was raised. So God declared his work right. Now I can be justified in Christ. And so now we believe in that seed. And it's not just Abraham. The one who believes in that will be justified in his sight this morning. You'll be declared not guilty. And you'll be loved and accepted by God. And you can have free access and communion and fellowship with the living God. And this is based on the promise of God. And God put His Son in a grave and raised Him so that you could be certain that it's all of grace. He accomplished all of salvation. It's no longer by your works, but by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin and believing, and you will be saved. Amen? May God give us the faith of Abraham. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, allowing my voice to hold out. God, I thank you for the beauty of this Bible. Thousands of years of you coloring out such a promise. God, many all over the world having the faith of Abraham and believing in the seed that you promised to bless the nations with. And so God, I pray for this world. God, I pray for many during this time, that they would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would believe in the one that you delivered up and raised for our justification. God, I pray that many would call upon this name and be saved. I pray if there are any in here who have played with Jesus for many, many years but have never come to Christ, that they would call upon his name even now as a Savior, that they would believe what you say is true. Oh God, we can be certain, we can bank everything on this promise that the one who believes in Christ will be saved. God, we can throw everything on it and be eternally safe. 
and have the eternal blessing that you promised. God, I pray, let every soul fall on Christ this morning and give life to the dead. God, raise children like Isaac. Give birth. Give life by your grace this morning. God, you're a saving God. Save any who need it here this morning. And I pray for the believers. Oh God, we want our faith strengthened. We don't want to waver in unbelief and have weak faith in the days that we live in. God, we want to believe your promises and trust them and live into them and know that they're absolutely certain. And we want to give glory to you. We want you to look great as we are unwavering and trusting in you and all that you've said and all that you will do. Oh God, thank you for the solid rock, Jesus Christ. I thank you for him. I thank you that you sent your son in the world to be a savior. And so God, let every soul call upon that name. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.